Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, this morning, we have with us Rashad Norris, who is the Executive Dir Director of Relevant Engagement, LLC. Uh, Rashad received his BA in Marketing Communication with a minor in English from the University of Puget Sound, where he also played basketball. He earned his Master's in Public Administration from Evergreen State College. As the founder of Re uh, Relevant Engagement LLC and the HERO Incarcerated Young Men Mentoring Program, and HERO is an acronym for Honor Education and Respect Others. He has extensive experience in working with teachers and administrators, nonprofit organizations, community-led programs and initiatives, students from various backgrounds, incarcerated youth, young adults, and most importantly, our black males. Rashad is a first-generation college attendee and graduate on both sides of his family tree. At the time he attended the University of Puget Sound, black students made up only 2% of the student population. Rashad is currently the Director of Community Engagement at Highline College and has led teams and developed programs that create sustainable interpersonal relationships. His personal, professional, and educational development around teaching culturally relevant practices, youth leadership development, anti-racist cultural responsiveness, community engagement, mentoring, and program assessment has equipped him with the ability to lead conversations, workshops, and keynote addresses. And with that, we welcome you, Rashad, and the floor is yours. San Sandy, who, who gave you that bio? Liz did. That's a nice bio. I'm going to say, Liz, can, you write, <laughs> can I use that bio? Like, okay, I do a lot. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I couldn't sleep last night because I was so excited, you know, and I think that um, it's just, it brings me joy to be able to speak around um, Black history, and I do this on a daily basis, so I don't use February in a way to um, think that that's it, you know, that's the only time I speak about it, so I, I'm really thankful to be here, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciated to, appreciative to be invited to speak with you all, and yes, I'm a UPS grad, you know, um, you know, back in the 90s, I think late 90s it was, something around there. But um, yeah, I play a little basketball, I did a little something around here in, in Tacoma area. So I'm from Spanway, Washington. So, and I live out here in Puyallup with my family. Um, I'm married, been, I think I'm, I don't know, let me get the years right, because let me see, 18, 20, I say 25, one of those years, been married that long, but I got three babies. I got a high schooler and two middle schoolers. Um, one and go, one goes to Spenway or Liberty Middle School, Spenway Junior High, and then I have a uh, uh, Grand Capowers in as well. So I got three babies, two boys and a girl. My baby girl, that's my chocolate drop. So, and that's my that's my 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 Afro puff, and so you may see her come down here because she just always want to be around her daddy, which gives me joy. So, um, I'm good with that. Um, man, so I lead conversations, and so best believe um, this will be a conversation because I, I just I, the training. I don't like the word training. I just don't. I just I love conversation, and. What I'm going to share with you today is a conversation around just what is Black history? What does that look like? What's that mean when you start to talk about um, Black history and the contributions of African-American Blacks in America today? And some information that you may not have heard just because some of our Black history, many of, much of our Black history that is given to our students in school is varied um, it's not watered down, but it's very bland in a sense that allows the teacher to teach it because it uses the same vernacular or same language to describe our leaders that they um, typically highlight, which is Dr. King and Rosa Parks and so forth. Um, so I want to definitely go into some individuals that, you know, hopefully, uh, and not hopefully, but um, I'm, I'm, I promise that many of you probably have never heard of these individuals, which will also um, bring me joy because my thing is I'm always trying to enlighten and bring new knowledge to whoever I'm talking to. So, and then some of you may have heard of these individuals, but I definitely want to make sure that I give you something to leave and, and really think about when you um, go into um, wanting to do more work around history 
especially Black history. Um, I, I, I labeled this presentation, I've done this presentation um, quite often, and I think it is suitable for you as well. So I would say that, um, you know, wait, this is Dr. King. This is someone that we always have marbled around in our schools. And we're growing up around Dr. King's message of, you know, peaceful protests, um, very um, nonviolent. And, and he talks about nonviolence, which is a part of his, part of his, ide his, his identity. But he also had this identity that we don't really talk about and it's called weight. And I'm going to further to let you know when he talked about weight and what he was really talking about there, what he really wanted to explain in one of his last books that I have um, called Why We Can't Wait. And this is one of his last books that he wrote before he was assassinated. But before I do that, I always do what, what is appropriate and you do a land acknowledgement. So what you do is you always acknowledge the land that you're on and you pay respect and you pay um, your due respect to those native and our indigenous people who were here before us. And, you know, we're on the Wamish and Coast Slatis land. And if you don't know the land that you occupy on, and I'm on Pure Olive land. So if you don't know the land that you occupy, it's always good to go look at it. And there is a website you can go to and click on and see what are you, what land are you truly occupying right now that you need to do, give respect and give honor to. And then secondly, I always acknowledge um, um, and respectfully acknowledge our enslaved people, primarily African descent who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. And today we are indebted to the labor and the labor of many black brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows for our collective benefit. So I wanna acknowledge that as well. Um, it's, it's very important that we do that, especially during a time of black history, but I do it regardless um, if it's black that were lost in a black community um, because we are now having more conversations around DEI, diversity and equity and inclusion. Well, I always include the plus I, which is the diversity, equity, inclusion, plus injustice. Because what happens is people jump to, um, they, 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 they jump to now wanting to do more trainings around DEI after we saw the murder of um, brother George Floyd. And it continues to go on within our community. And so I wanna make sure we just acknowledge these names. So I'm just gonna just put myself on mute because I do this every time and I will not stop my practice. So I'm gonna put myself on mute and I'm just gonna read through these names and then I'll come back. But I definitely wanna pay respects and pray honest to the individuals that lost their lives. And now we are able to now have a conversation around why diversity, equity and inclusion and injustice is important. Thank you, family. And if you know anyone that you may have lost or friends, family that you, have, you may have lost through domestic violence, um, domestic terror, you know, even police brutality, you know, my heart and condolence goes out to you as well. Um, this is an important issue in our community. So I wanna make sure that I acknowledge these individuals that lost their lives. And back to when I was saying about weight and Dr. King, you know, he was at the podium and he was talking and, you know, when he got jailed in Birmingham, he just was tired of this word weight. It was always something that was ringing in his ear. And for, for years and years, he's always was told, wait, you know, wait, Dr. King, things are going to come. It's going to get better. You know, just wait. Things are going to, um, you know, um, dissolve and, you know, equality is going to, um, it's going to reach its, its, its height. Um, but as you can see in this quote, wait almost meant never. And he says, we must come to see with, no, uh, uh, with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. And I just wanna ask you where we keep waiting for to make this transition, to make this jump, to make this change. Because what I'm gonna share with you is some stuff that uh, I hope you understand that, you know, the black community has been waiting for a long time now. 
and you need to understand what happens emotionally, physically, and 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 mentally to the black community when continued after continued injustices happen right in front of our faces. And he had this quote that I live by, and it says, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I had this plastered everywhere in my house. And when you go upstairs at night, everywhere, I'll take that back. That was exaggeration. But I have it plastered in my son's and my kids' rooms, and I have it plastered on my computer. But it really speaks volumes when you continue to do you know, to, to have sincere ignorance and conscious stupidity. What he was talking to was the injustice of segregation. And what was happening was he said that it's so dangerous to not know what you don't know. And you don't even know that you don't know what you don't know. And when you keep a group of individuals so segregated from the truth, so dis distant from the truth, you keep them sincere, sincerely ignorant. That's dangerous. That's more dangerous than you walking down the street with guns, with these things that you think are making people fearful. It's more dangerous when you are sincerely ignorant. You can't learn. You can't read or write. You just don't know how to. And that was something that our white brothers and sisters, the white dominant culture, it kept us separate because education was the key component. Now, conscientious stupidity says that you know you're wrong when you keep doing the same thing, thinking you're going to get something and a different result. You know you're wrong. That's conscientious stupidity. You know you are wrong to have the same policies, the same procedures, the same practices, the same rules, the same guidelines, knowing that these things are the things that are keeping people separate and keeping them sincerely ignorant. Hope you catch on with me, Alice. I see you shaking your head. I love it. And I appreciate you on that. And I'm going to tell you something. See, Dr. King says something, Randy. Dr. King said that, you know, he was no longer scared of the Ku Klux Klan. He was no longer fearful of people sicking dogs or police sicking dogs on them. He was no longer fearful of bombs being put in around his house. That fear didn't get him no more. The biggest fear he had was the white moderate who just sat there and said nothing at all. You see, Gina, I see you shaking your head right too, because you're right. That white moderate, the one who just sits there and still benefits from all the things that have happened to the black community, you are the ones that he was fearful of because you are the ones who need to speak up more. You are the ones who need to become accomplices and not just allies. No longer are you just to sit there and be an ally and say, I'm, I wanna be a part of the movement, but you back. Accomplice says, I'm gonna go down with you. I'm gonna create a plan. I'm gonna start to tear this down with you. So if they come get me, it's like they getting you because I'm a part of the whole plan. So I hope that we build accomplices in this game because that's what we need. And before I go on, I got to tell you the shoulders that I stand on. I stand on the shoulders of Harriet Tubman. I stand on the shoulders of when I do this work, when I go out and talk to young people and talk to students, I know that, you know what, I'm trying to reach as many as I can. And some don't know that they're still trapped right now. They just don't know. Just like Harriet Tubman said, she reaches, she went back to reach as many slaves as she could. And she could have got more only if they know they were enslaved. Only if they knew that. So I still go back and I reach one or two. That's all that it, it, it counts to me. If I can get one or two. And then Frederick Douglass, he is somebody that I marvel after because I remember going to UPS and I remember struggling as a black student in that school and not having an identity and not understanding my place in that school because I was the only black child in most of my classes. And it was until my, my white professor who became my mentor gave me the Frederick Douglass book that I have right here that I always keep. And it has the U sticker right here. I kept this book because he gave me this book to read. And he didn't give it to me to read just because Rashad, you know, write you a paper. He gave it to me to empower me. Black history empowered me. And what it said in here was Frederick Douglass was teaching himself how to read. The slave owner's wife and children were teaching him how to read. And when Frederick Douglass, when the slave owner came home and caught him being taught how to read from the wife and the children, he tells the wife and child, children. You don't teach a nigger how to read because if you do, they become unslave-like and then they start to question and they start to become way too, 
too, too aggressive and wanting to get out of the situation. You keep them dumb and you keep them an, an intelligent and you keep them servient to what you want them to do. That's what I was told by Frederick Douglass. So Miss Tanya, that was my inspiration. That was one of them. And then Malcolm X. Malcolm X said, you know what? When you learn something new and you transform your behavior, best believe you better go share all that knowledge with your community. You don't hold knowledge. You don't hold it. You don't hold it and then walk around thinking that you're a bourgeois because you got this knowledge you don't share with none of your others because they all are lost. And it wasn't until he got captured and got put in prison and he read through the dictionary and learned how to speak and learn how to articulate himself. And when he went into the nation of Islam, he found his faith, he found his strength to be able to provide information. And it wasn't until I read Malcolm X that I said, you know what, that's what somebody shows I want to stand on. Amos Wilson, Dr. Amos Wilson is a psychologist. He talked about the, the, the developmental psychology of the black child. He talked about how culture and identity is very important. Most of our black children, most of the black community, there needs to be a culture, needs to be an identity that we have lost. And because you're not teaching it, because we're not teaching it in school, a lot of our children just don't know. They don't know what they don't know, and they don't even know that they don't know what they don't know. So they're lost in their cultural identity that I, I am obligated to go out there and teach and, and to understand. And then Angela Davis, come on now. Come on now. I see you, Miss Samantha. You know some Angela Davis. You know, Angela Davis is a she's she's a pillar. That's one thing we don't talk about is our black women. Black women, what? Man, I love my black women. I love my mama. Yeah, I love my wife. I got me a chocolate drop at the house and I love it. You know, I love the strength that she brings to the table to my children. I love the strength that my mom brought to the table for my for the, for the family. I know what she put that in. I know what she instilled in me. I love Angela Davis for our young women. I love that she rocked that Afro. Do you know my little girl got an Afro? Do you know that she used to go to school and kids used to be like, oh, you got your little mushroom. And she wanted to come home one day. She said, daddy, I want to straighten my hair like Elsa. I was like, Elsa? Who the, who the hell Elsa? She was like, you know, the Elsa, the little, the, the, I was like, what? And I forgot what the show was called, but um. I forgot, you know what it is too. I know you know what it is. This little cartoon, this little girl named Elsa, she used to, little ice and all that, whatever. And I said, no, 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 no. You are not Elsa. Your name is Angela Davis. So I had to show her like, look at the Afro baby. Enjoy the Afro. They want your hair. Do you know how many people want your hair to stand out like that? So I had to encourage her. I had to get her all into it, Linda, to let her know that you know, your hair is beautiful. So I had to encourage her and show her her historical context of where her hair comes from and what people rocked it and what people were a part of your history. James Baldwin. He is part of our LBGTQ population. He was almost ousted out the Black community because he was gay. But I'm talking about a poet and an artist and an a activist. And he was, a, a, he was an agitator. He had no part of a stimulant. He was a straight agitator. And he had this quote that I use as well. And it says, if you don't know what happened behind you, you will never understand what's happened around you. So you have to do the historical contest. You have to look back behind you and see what's going on and understand what's going on around you today. So I got some stuff to share with you. And then last but not least, when all these individuals are pillars of what I stand for around learning and, and learning new information, this young lady is Marsha P. Johnson. I just found out about Marsha P. Johnson a couple months ago, maybe this past, yeah, past eight months ago or so. And her story is on Netflix and she was transgender and she is the leader she is like the pioneer of the Stonewall, the Stonewall riots up in New York, where they beat these transgender individuals, beat them to death, killing them. They were getting killed by the week, one by one, one by one, because they just didn't know, understand that population. But there was a strong Black identity, uh, identified transgender individual, Marsha P. Johnson, who stood for the rights for transgender and the LBGQ population. 
So in all different facets, all different identities, all different shades of color, the Black community stands strong. Black history is strong. And if you don't know who Mrs. Henrietta Lacks is, I would say that you need to go on Netflix again and go check this out. Once again, this Black woman, she is a pioneer in the, the cell research and her cells are still being used. What? What? Come on now. This is history. And then you have Miss Ida B. Wells. She was fighting against lynching. And the lynching, now mind you, the last lynching really was in 1996, I think it was, like James Byrd. I don't know if you guys remember this, but James Byrd was not only lynched, but he was drugged by a truck. You know, these they, they drug him by a truck but by and, and limbs everywhere. Like, this is serious. This is, and, and so don't think that lynching just stopped, you know, when, when, when that passed back in, I think it was 46, 36, somewhere around there. But no, there was still some things going on around lynching and, and forms of lynching um, in, the, in the 90s, late 90s, early 90s. And then I can't think about our youth. I can't stop what I'm going to do. I got to, Greg. I got to bring the loose dinner here. And if you don't know, shoot, Ruby Bridges, Ruby Bridges, first little girl to walk through, through a school. Come on now. Can you imagine walking through a school with guns blazing, people yelling all kind of obscenities at you, you little girl? And I'm over here worried about my daughter getting talked about, about you know, her hair. Shoot, these people were, what? That's, that's terrorists, domestic terrorists. They were after her for wanting to go into school. So we had to look to think about all the trauma that went through this little baby girl and what she probably passed on. And we will talk about that too, because it does get passed on, you know? And if you don't know family, the founder of black history is Carter G. Woodson. That's the founder. And just know Carter G. Woodson founded this and he just wanted a week. It actually started out just a day to celebrate black history and it turned to a week and then they gave February, what? It didn't span to February till 1976. That's less than 50 years. Just now are we now talking about Black history. So in saying that, he wrote this book. And in Black history, you have to understand, he wrote this book called The Miseducation of the Negro. This is a powerful book. This is like a Bible in most Black families, especially if you're, uh, uh, or I would say towards Black males for sure. Um, and this book, it questions and it goes into systems and institutionalized racism and how to recognize it and how to really think about how you've been educated. And there's a proverb, an African proverb around education, and it says that education really means to induce. That word isn't to induce, to bring the best out. I can train you or I can educate you. Most of our kids right now are being trained to think that that is the right way. But when I educate you, I bring the best out of you. I induce you. So he talked about how it is important to bring the best out of us that we already have and not to be caught up in being trained to think that these systems that we're in are for the benefit for you, truly the benefit for you. He says, when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to do worry about his actions. He will find his proper place and he will stay in it. You don't have, you don't need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. And in fact, if there's no back door, he will cut one out. So a mental slave is just as worse as a physical slave. When you allow yourself to always think that you're doing right, you're being told to do this, and it has nothing to do with the benefit of bringing the best out of you. So then you start thinking Black history. What other Black history is out there that our young people don't know or what you don't know? Then you start thinking like, man, what am I missing out on? Who am I missing out on? Truly, Tom, who am I missing out on? Angela? Who are my babies missing out on, Sandy? They're missing out on the color of law. They're missing out on understanding the redlining. They're missing out on what this looks like when systems were already in play to keep you segregated, Miss Carly. It was already there in play. You need to read this. The Peculiar Institution, slavery before the, ante, before the antebellum of the South. How are jobs, how are systems for working class? How is that truly set up? 
Do you know that slavery was a complete system? Do you know it had the manager, director? Did it have, do you know it had those different branches of individuals who were looking after other slaves? Did you know that? You know, do you know about the destruction of the black civilization? Do you know about the, the 19 dynasties that were out there that we had, black kings and queens? Do you know about that? Do you know about, do you know about the first genius in Hotep? Do you know about him? You probably don't know about him. These are things that our young people are missing out on. This is a genius, not only a genius, he was the first scientist, archeologist, doctor, mathematician. He built the pyramids. He was a part of that, that's history. So when we talk about STEM, we talk about science, technology, engineering, and math, and do you look at those fields and you see no more than maybe, what, 3%, 4% Black African-American students in these fields? Are you serious? A lot of your ancestors, a lot of your greatness comes from the Black dynasties or comes from Black history, and you don't know that? We have to teach you this because you have to see yourself in these fields, Miss Debbie. You have to see yourself because if you don't, you won't know. And then you start about, talk about black labor. You start talking about Dr. Claude Anderson. These are, this is another individual that goes into the wealth mechanism of black communities. When you start talking about the wealth, when you start talking about the income, when you start talking about business minded, when you start talking about entrepreneurship, what does that look like? You know, the dollar in the black community only circulates in the community no more than a couple hours. A couple hours it stays in the community. We get our dollar and we spend it in other communities before we spend it in our own community. That's ours. And I don't know the direct statistics, but I know in a white community, I think it's a couple of days. In the Asian community, it's weeks. Why? Because they have a community. They have the drug stores. They have the food industry. They have the markets. They have that. And best believe, we had that as well. So history shows that we had that. So we had to show our babies that we had us a Black community thriving in Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, we was booming. We, we was balling. You couldn't get nothing for you. You couldn't get us to leave our community because we were balling so hard. It was beautiful. We had the businesses. We had the churches. We had the restaurants. We had everything. But it wasn't until that one day, that one day that a 19-year-old Black man, 19-year-old Black man, shoe shiner, stepped on a, it was a elevator when Miss Susan Pay, 70 years old, she was the, she was the elevator um, controller. He gets on the elevator, elevator closes, opens, she screams, assault. They get this black man. They put him in jail. While he's in jail, white men are walking around the jail wanting to lynch this brother, lynch him without no further, no, no, no case or nothing. I just wanted to lynch him off a of person that she was assaulted. The black community come down to support him. When they came down to support him, they come in, they're trying to support. Now, mind you, some of these black um, community members came with some guns because it was like, man, we gotta support this brother. Well, they come in, some skirmish happens in the crowd and guess what happens then? They burn the building, they burn Tulsa, Oklahoma down. And when I say they burnt it down, they say this is the worst riot, worst um, race riot in, the, in, in American history. Destroyed everything. 10,000 plus people, 300 businesses gone to the ground. Blueprints gone. If you would to look, look at the money that was damaged, what was lost during the time in 2019, it was $32 million. $32 million. That's how much it was down that was burnt to the ground gone. People, Black people died. They had to move out. Some stayed and just kept with the terror. They just stayed there and just said, you know what, we're going to stay and try to rebuild. It never got back to where it was before. So you can't tell me my babies don't know about, that, that they know about this history, because some really don't know about this history. And it just, it, just, it just hurts my heart that they're still fighting, and we're still looking for equality. We still try to choose a claim that we just men. That's it. Look at me as a man. 
we still are sports activists are still out there. We're still just saying, don't shoot. Please don't shoot. We're still just active for voting rights. Now, politicians, you see the game is changing right now. It's changing. And we're still going through that. But I'm going to do this exercise with you because I do it with my own kids. And I do it with kids who are out there. Let me stop real quick. By a show of hands, by a nod. If you just learned something new at what I just said, raise your hand. Man, I love it. Y'all making my, you, you, look, you about to make a, like, look, black men, we do, we, we, we can, you know, we can blush too. Don't trip. I can blush and I can, I can still cry. I got emotions, you know, Deborah, don't do, don't think I, I, I appreciate you. Evan, I appreciate you. Miss Joy, I appreciate you because this is something that I love doing. I want to share new knowledge. I want to share new knowledge. Is this Lori? You got her hand raised? Who got the hand raised? Go ahead. You can, you, you want to say something? Go ahead. Or you just give me a high five. Okay, you give me a high five. So this is the question. I go out to these schools all day, every day. And I'm always asking these babies about Black history because they always tell me, oh, Dr. King and Rosa Parks. I'm like, okay, okay, that's good. Let me just ask you this, babies. Let me ask you this, adults. What would the world look like without Black people? If I was to ask you that, what would the world look like without Black people? What would it look like? You know, just think about it real quick. Because I know we got to go on because we got to do, you know, I got I to gotta keep moving because of presentation. But this is a question that I, that I, I truly pose to our young people in a community. And I'm going to show you something. Because I want you to see what our young people and what other community members think of us as Black people. This is the first one. They think it would be plain, born, colorless, no sports, no soul, no fried chicken, no chitlins, no sex, no slavery, no rap music, no LeBrons, no, no Jordans, no black history, no gangs, no violence, no drugs. You see this? This is what they, this is, this is black. This is black to a lot of our community members and our babies. That's what it is. No weaves, no empire. No shoe gang. Once again, we're there again. No rock music. No blues. No Eddie Murphy. I was like, oh, no, wait a minute. How, how old y'all? How y'all know Eddie Murphy? What? Like, what? Eddie Murphy. I was like, man, you don't get out here with this. No BT. And this is the one. No Seahawk defense. Look, I know y'all laughing. Look, 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 look. That's funny, huh, Susan? You see that? See? But Shayna laughing, because y'all know, if you look at the Seahawks right now, I guarantee in your head, you probably like, damn, you know, you don't, don't, they right. They, they right. I don't see that. But that's a visual aid. That's just a visual aid. You know, no rap music, different slaves. And you see that that's what they're seeing as Black people. But then I show them this. And I said, did you know about all these black inventors and people who invented stuff that you still use on a daily basis. And some of y'all still use some of this stuff on a daily basis, Miss Linda. And I hope that you use the toilet because you want to thank Brother T. Elkins for the toilet. You got the refrigerator. You know, somebody that I'm just marvel after when I did more research is Granville T. Woods. What, how much systems that he built and put together. And mind you, my library, I have the book right here. So you just know, I didn't make none of this up. This is my Black Inventors book that I bring out to the schools and I get to show the babies. And I also show how things were made. The elevator, I showed them how it was a manual at first. It was wood and they, they had the strength pulling it up to the next level and it was for building things. So then it got transmitted to like a whole system. They were like, man, we can put this in buildings, you know? So then it just started to grow. Man, you look at the, the telephone system, the golf tee. Come on now, I'm a golfer now, I love golf. 
I didn't think I was ever pick up golf, but I'm a golfer now. Um, my knees are too bad to go out there and play ball. So I got to pick something else up. The lawnmower, you know, you know, we still got the, the, the peanut butter. I have these young people who were in the trains. And I said, do you know that the first train alarm was created by a black man, Jim? Did you know? The kids is like, what? Really? Yeah. Come on now. Black history goes way beyond Dr. King. This is some good information. This is empowering information. We need to empower and motivate our young people around what this looks like. And now let's go beyond Black history real quick. Let's just go beyond it. And let's get to anti-Black racism. Let's get to the system and the, and the, the grounded discrimination that is still in a lot of our policies today that you need to see, that you probably are unaware of, or you're probably aware of, but I'm going to point it out a little bit more. It involves those stereotypes and attitudes, so you can see it. And these are the injustices that are happening right in the Black community, right in front of our faces. The education system, the employment system, the healthcare system, the political presence system, and then the housing system, which we all play a part of. And when let me just get to where I'm at. The system that I play in is the education system. And without education, there's a lot of things that you just cannot do. If I don't bring the best out of you, you're not going to make the best living. It's going to be hard for you. And it's difficult. So in our education system, I want you to just check something out. Our teacher demographics, this is important for you to see. Um, our teacher demographics, there's over, and I can read this for you. I'm sorry, this may be a little bit too small. I want to keep the grass up there. And this comes from the OSPI, if you don't know. This is the Office of School Public Instructions. This is Washington State's numbers. So you can look on this website as well and pull all these demographics out if you want to. And if you see this, the percentage of students, teachers that are in our classrooms, gender-wise, is almost 75% white females, okay? White females, almost 75%. Diana, I know you're shaking your head. I hear you. And when you start to um, really understand that over those, um, like I said, and the classroom teacher by race is what, like I said, white, they're what, 87%, I'm sorry about that, 87%, 87. So I shorten the number a little bit, but it's 87 white females. That's a large number. And I didn't even put down the age difference on here and not saying ages is, number percent white females I think it was like 50 percent are 50 years or older so our younger students are our, our younger our, our younger um, teacher population is not as strong as we would like it to be now this is the education injustice I want you to look at this the number of black students in Washington State's public school district or public school system is about 4.5%. That's the number. If you look at the disciplinary rates amongst black students, it's 8.3, it's double. Now, I don't know about you if you know this, but the disciplinary rate, when these kids get disciplined, they get, they get sent to this thing called ISS, which is an in-school suspension. And they stick these kids in these rooms as this is just a suspension and there's no education, there's no type of learning going on. It's almost just like a jail system. I've been in there and there's no windows in these rooms. These kids are sitting in lines and they're playing, they're doing things that are, that are not conducive to their learning environment, nothing at all. And some of those individuals who are sitting in there, they're not teachers, they may be parents educators so they cannot teach or they cannot help these students with any of their homework uh, as a tutor or anything like that so it's almost like you're babysitting them and I go in and talk with these students that's how sad our system is is with disciplining a lot of our black and brown babies especially our black kids so that's the education injustice now when you get to the education injustice and you can't get a job and because your education limits you from getting a good job then you start thinking about what is my buying power to get homes and so forth. I don't have that buying power. I don't have it. And so then you start looking at the gaps in home ownership and you start looking at, oh my God, you know, Chris Herbert, he does a study over at Harvard. 
And he says systemic racism leads to like lower rates of education, lower income for blacks, which leads to lower credit scores and lack of savings. So then you start thinking about the historical context. You start thinking that the 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 connection, the inner um, the inner connection of all of those things, your education, your home ownership. You start to look at all of that and how it's all connected, and you start to really think like, man, did the 1968 Fair Housing Act really do anything? It still lingers. It's still there. It is still there. It did nothing really. And the policies are still there. You look at it. You can see the red line still happening. You can see the, man, the gentrification happening. I'm out here in Puyallup. And I, I don't think, y'all never see this many black and brown people out here. It is, it is growing. And the number of homes are growing. There's another 150 homes about to be built out here where I'm staying at. And these homes are not no cheap. These are not cheap. When I say cheap, cheap in money. Material, we can talk about that later. But cheap in money. I'm just thinking like, hey, it costs now to live. It costs a lot. And we're outbidding our own babies, my kids. I'm not scared for my, 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 um, not my culture, but I'm not scared of my generation. I'm scared of the next generation behind me. That's the ones that I'm just really fearful of because you start to see that the 1968 Fair Housing Act, it didn't do anything really. You still look at the loan denials. I don't know if you guys saw that or you know this, but you probably do. But the loan denials for Blacks is crazy. It's, it's um, what, 12% of the time? And the average is only 6%? I mean, that's double. That's double. Let me just tell you, I was able to do something this past year. But this past year, and it was a beautiful thing what I was able to do. And I'm gonna share with you after I get through with this. But why home ownership? How, why does it really matter? It builds wealth. And then you start looking at the household, the wealth between households. One hundred thirty-nine thousand compared to only twelve thousand for black households. That's more than double. That's true. But I don't. That's that's. I don't know my math right now. But that's a that's a large gap. And then you start thinking about, you know, what does that do for yourselves when you start to think better, positive for yourself when you own something like a home and it does something to you. It just really, the health, the health, your schooling, your relationships, it does something to you. And I'm going I'm to I'm bring that into relation to where I'm at with my own situation. This is probably one of the first home buyers um, after in 1936, um, Miss Mary um, Parable. And it changed her whole, whole generation. It changed the generation um, gap, the finances, everything. And I want to highlight that because I want to get to where I'm at with my life right now. Family, realtors, I was able to buy my mom a home this past December. My mom's been renting for the last 20 plus years, just throwing money away. And I told myself, I'm going to save up. I'm going to put a down payment for my mama. And I bought my mama home. And I forgot who said they stayed out here. But I want to say, um, I forgot who said it. But, oh, it was you, Liz. My, I bought my mom a house out there by you. She is in Shelton, Washington. She has a nice land by herself. She has, you know, she's close to some water. It's just her and her dog out there. And it's like a real grandmama house. It takes me about an hour, 20 minutes to get out there, which I'm okay. My kids love it. It is beautiful. But my mom's face the way she is so proud to say that she has a home where she's going to be able to pass down to her grandbabies to say, I have something. And it is a beautiful thing. It changed her whole just behavior, her motivation. Just things, it did something to her because she was just throwing money away. And I see it in her and I see the life that it breathes in her. So after buying my mama, thank you, Camille. Thank you for buying, uh, after buying my mama home, I just see what it's done to her. And I know that we have to change this generation of our young black communities around what this looks like when we start talking about investing in a home. And if you start looking at the Seattle, the gap just, it continues to get wider and wider where the, uh, the African-American population, it only owns 28% of the homes in this area. That's it. The lowest of the lowest. And so we have to start looking at what practices are in place. What is keeping that community 
so far behind and what is going on. You start looking at what can you do? You just start doing more implicit bias trainings, things that you need to be highlighted, highlighted and, and really talk about how are you engaging with that community? If you're engaged with that community, are you being equitable in the way that you are presenting your information? Who do you continue to go to? You know, are you in support of the Fair Housing Act? If you see change, what are you doing to be that accomplice to make that a better um, act? And then also, you know, undoing some of the discriminatory practices. You know, we have to, we have to help out looking at names. Just because it's say Rashida, do you really want to go through and try to do a credit app for that? Because it has a little ethnic name behind it. Do you want to really want to go and, and take this person out to go look at homes? Because you may think that, you know what? They can't buy this house anyway. You wasted my time. And I've seen that. I've seen it. I've been a part of it. I've been a part of the whole non the non behavior, um, you know, the, 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 the non behavior, you know, behaviors that I've seen when your whole body just almost drops when you see someone who you may think that, you know what, you're about to waste my time. You're about to waste my time. And it'd be a pe person of color. You know, community outreach is important. And really the conversation with our young people around house, housing, um, purchase, investments, and so forth. We're so quick to have them talk about things that are, you know, so it's relatable to them, like their, like sports, music, entertainment, something like that. We got to go a little bit deeper now. We got to start talking about investments, housing investments. I work with incarcerated youth on a daily basis. Every Sunday, I go through that. What you're looking at right now is my program that I credit for these incarcerated youth who are getting out. And this is called Made Man. It stands for making a difference every day. And on the back of it, it has the quote from Malcolm X. And these young boys, they wear these shirts. They feel so empowered. But the thing that they always want, they talk about is Brother Rashad, how do we get into a house home ownership? They want to home owns. They want to be realtors. They want to, they understand land was something that was taken away from the community. It's that education around it. And so I would tell you that if you know anyone who can, you can start the conversation with, that would be perfect. Start the conversation with them and get them to understand the importance of land and what this looks like. And once again, we go through all this injustice. We've been going through this injustice for some time, and it continues to happen on a daily basis. Something that your conversation may be different than a lot of Black community members in their household conversation. It may be different, and I promise you, it probably is different. We're talking about totally two different things. This is where we got to close our conversation gap, and so you can understand. It's called empathy over sympathy. I don't want you to sympathize with me. I want you to have empathy. I want you to feel it. So in order you to, to, to fill it, I got to share with you and for you to understand what this does over a generation. Because if you want to go to slavery, if you want to go there and you want to start there, I want to share with you this young lady. Her name is Dr. Joy DeGruy. And Dr. Joy DeGruy is a psychologist. And she's, she is like a Black therapist to me. She is someone who I look up to. I love her work. And her book is right here. And it's called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And she wrote this book a couple years back. Um, and it's a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generation trauma and don't even know that it's been going on for some time around slavery and of the any oppression and institutionalized racism that continues to this day. So that trauma, it just infills, it just, it fuels itself and it continues to fuel itself. And it just an outburst that you feel that you don't even know where it's coming from. So she did something. She did a study around it. And I want to share this with you because I know this is be something that you, you can start to do research on yourself and you can start to understand where she's coming from. And so bear with me real quick, because I want to share this with you. And I know that this would be something that um, you could take back with you. You could read the book. The book is something that I highly recommend. Um, she is someone that, like I said, I look up to. You know, she, um, I had a chance to go with her 
I had a chance to I had a chance to go with her. She was a keynote speaker at one of our um, conferences, and so I had to go pick her up. And as I had to go pick her up, you know, we were, the conference over at Western Washington, and so she was coming to Seattle. So I had to drive all the way down to pick her up to Seattle. And when I'm driving down there, traffic is just growing because it was a midday, and I was like, "Oh my God, traffic's gonna be so thick." So I'm making sure my car's all clean and everything. And next thing you know. I get in the car, she gets in the car, and we're driving back up to Western Washington. And I'm so enthralled in her because I love her work that she's talking to me. And family, while she's talking to me, I'm rolling over all the turtles, just, and I'm looking at her, trying to look at her, listen to her. And she says, baby, pull over. Let's go to Starbucks and we can talk. I said, okay, thank you, because I'm about to wreck. So we pull over. And she actually gives me the training book. This is the study guide that she gave me and she signed it for me. She did all that for me. And to this day, um, I'm always using her material because she is so, it's beautiful. It's beautiful how she explains herself and how she explains. I wanna share with you. So just take a look at this and then, you know, I will conclude my presentation and I appreciate you all for um, listening. Traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on, and then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African-American experience, starting with slavery as a real clear long enduring traumas. I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she gonna say? No, he's not, he's, he's stupid, he's, he's shiftless, he can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening in someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize 
a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're going to fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, uh, feeling a foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adult because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, as young as 10. When you start looking at the, the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, we know finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize. It becomes a part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information, they, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We gotta work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. And we also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppress you and to continue to injure you. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect a change. They have to be done collectively. All right, family. I was told that I got me an hour. So with that being said, um, my thing is, what is your next movement? That is the thing. Not a moment. Don't allow this to be a moment. What is your next movement? And so I just challenge you all to really think about this and really think about how and where are you building relationships? Where are you building conversations around injustice? Where are you building conversations about equity, um, especially in your field of work? Um, and how are you being a part and, and really being uh, accomplice and making sure that, you know what, my practice, what I'm giving, what I'm doing is equitable and it's for justice. And with that being said, I am Brother Rashad and I approve this message. I'm done. Oh, thank you so much, Rashad. I appreciate you and your time and your presentation mm -hmm. today. Uh, do you want to take any questions? Does anybody have any questions for Rashad? Mm -hmm. No questions? Oh, Everybody? go ahead, Ms. Camille. Hi, thank you for being uh, on this Zoom call with me today and raising my knowledge. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a way to get that link uh, to that video? I, I think I need to watch it 10 more times. And okay. There was I, a I'm, lot of content there. It was. I'm going to put it in, uh, put it in the um, chat for you. Okay. Thank you. I think this is it right here. Let me see. I think that's it. I think I did it right. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for the, thank you for the words. That's that. I mean, that means a lot. So thank you. Rashad, yes. is, is there a website or a store we can go to support the shirt you have on? Oh, <laughs> well, you know what? This is my personal shirt. I create this shirt to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, start I, yeah. a website. Yeah. I created it. I created it. <laughs> husband oh uh, well thank you yeah I, I um i started the shirt and it, it's funny uh you're not the only one who said that i've wear i wore this now on the past couple of presentations i had and people are like can we buy that shirt i'm like well let me give it to the boys first because i just created the peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program and i'm going down next week to hand in the shirt and these young, yeah and these young boys are um at a green hill and green hill is the 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 youth jail down there and yep. you know going to where Shelton yeah so I work yep. with them down there and yeah. so I, I got to get these out first 
but Ooh. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But my, my, but my direct email, and I can, you know, we can really talk about that because okay. I, I don't, I don't mind getting that to you. Rashad, I have a question for you. It, it, I mean, there's probably, I don't know the answer. And so, um, you know, you mentioned the, 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 the black home ownership rate in Seattle. Yeah. And statewide, it's actually under 32%, which is below the national average. So yes. why when we live in a state that, that thinks it's so progressive, yep. is our home ownership rate below the national average? I just don't yep. understand that. I mean, yeah. and that's not just talking about, you know, I mean, we can talk about the high cost of housing in Seattle, but that's statewide, it's below the national average. And I don't understand why it's that would be. It's called that's systemic a, racism. Yeah, you go. Somebody just called it right on, right on his head. That's exactly yeah, what it is, it, systemic it, racism. I see it all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. And I just, and it's Tom, you, you mentioned that because I just saw I had that website up and I'm looking at it um, when you um, blacks in home ownership and you're right in Washington state is 32 and the national average is like 40 something, 40% or something. So you're right. We're still below the, the average. Yep. Can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. Hi everybody. Um, so I work with a lot of um, people of color in buying houses. And one of the reoccurring messages that we constantly receive is that a lot of them are first time home buyers and that they think that it's something for somebody else and not for us. Mm -hmm. And with our, you know, in, in, with people of color in our community, there's a trust factor. Yep. And, you know, we have, not only systematic racism, we also have historically where we've seen maybe our older relative that has owned a house that has been taken advantage of. And yeah. so the trust factor is, is if, you know, if you're not a person of color and you're trying to help a person of color, the best advice I can give you is listen, don't tell them how they should feel. One of the worst things that I see is that people will say, you know, well, why don't you just go to your older relative and go get the money? Like mm. you have to really understand the audience that you're working with Come on. to be able to serve them the best way. Come on. I love it. You are so, you are so correct, Corey. So correct. You know, um, I love it. And Danny, just to answer your question too, you can email me and I can tell you more about the, um, my program and so forth. Go ahead, Irene. Is it Irene? I, yeah. I didn't catch the name of one of the um, leaders you did, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm yeah. X. And then the next one was, psycho was Psychology. Oh, and his name is Amos Wilson. Amos Wilson? Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. A-M-O-S and then Wilson. This is a book. He, yeah, this is the book that he um, he wrote. I'm a, I'm a book. This is, and this is real. This is my library. So when people always say, oh, that's a nice little backdrop, like, no, this is really, that's real. That's, that's mine. Yeah. So okay, I kept thank on. Thank you. And what was, what was that book you just held up? It was the developmental psychology of the black child. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. thank it really you. goes into identity and so forth. Why that is so important. Very important. That's what we're missing, truly. And he talks about how we, you know, we say, you know, there's a term that we use in our, in the community called um, code switch. And he really dismisses that term because you can't switch from something that you don't even know that you are already. If you don't have a true identity, what are you switching into to go into some another whole another identity? So he talks about how identity is very important before we start using code switch. So he says that adaptation is, is more appropriate when you start talking about, to my young people, I say, let's adapt. Let's find out who you are. Let's know who you are, know your greatness, and then adapt that to your other environmental surroundings that you're going to. You shouldn't have to switch. You know, you should just adapt to know who you are and then use those skill sets to be able to operate in that new environment. Thank you. Yep. All right, are there any other questions? Oh, I appreciate you all. Ah, oh, that was good.
it felt good. It felt good. It felt good. So I just really appreciate you all for allowing me to be here. And I see some names out here that I know. I see my friend Ashley. Miss What's Ashley. Up, brother? How you doing? I'm good. Uh, it's good to see you. It's good hey, to see you. I'll show you my face. See oh, her picture. There you there go. You are. Oh, I love me some Ashley. I see my brother <laughs> Mosley here. I just, I just, it's good, it's good to see happen. you all. Oh, man, that's recorded. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to see you all. Well, there are some questions in the chat um, regarding this being recorded. It has been recorded, and we will be sharing it on our diversity um, webpage and also out to membership as well for people that missed it, because it is very important for everybody to watch, rewatch, and enjoy, so. Okay. Well, thank you once again. Once again, uh, I loved it. So you all, please um, be safe, stay healthy. Um, thank you again for allowing me to be here with you today and um, keep celebrating Black history beyond February. <laughs>